Good morning. In the year 2008, the critic Gitanjali Singh Chanda, she published a book titled Indian Women in the House of Fiction. So today before we start discussing Anita Desai's novel Cry the Peacock, I wanted to introduce to some of the concepts that she talks about in her seminal work Indian Women in the House of Fiction. While we were introducing the genre and the critical tradition which formulated uh, this uh, genre, the, this discipline, Indian fiction and English, we spoke about how uh, at a certain historical period, the, uh, in, the in, entire uh, oeuvre of work which falls under the uh, label Indian fiction, Indian writing in English, they were brought together and it was uh, began to be offered as a course by Srinivas Ayagar. We began to see how Minakshi Mukherjee makes this intervention by talking particularly about the genre of fiction and she began to uh, uh, alert us to the need to look at the genre specifically in the inter Indian historical context and uh, it was only much later from the 1990s onwards we began to pay very definite very focused attention on women who are writing in this house of uh, uh, Indian English fiction. So, Gitanjali Singh Chanda's work is positioned at a certain historical period when women's writings are gaining a certain attention and there is a sensibility that beyond ensuring mere visibility, there should also be sufficient critical attention, there should also be sufficient problematization of uh, women's writing especially in the context of the newfound visibility in the post uh, 1980s in the post uh, Rashti period. I find Gitanjali Singh Chanda's uh, in, uh, uh, in introduction to this work particularly useful. It is located uh, historically. She talks about how her own training had uh, made her insufficiently attentive to, attentive to certain kinds of texts and I quote from the introduction that she wrote in 2008. It was a restless April hot Delhi day and I was almost 19. I read Anita Desai's Cry the Peacock. The shock of recognition made me realize what I had missed in my study of canonical English literature. It was not just the presentation of an Indian context or names and people who looked and spoke like me, but the texture of the emotionally nuanced mindscapes of Desai's women characters that resonated and called me to myself. My heartfelt thanks to those who continue to write even when Indian women's writing in English was often viewed as mimicry. She speaks about the need to reinvent the canon, to need to reinvent the formulations, the lenses through which Indian's, uh, Indian women's uh, writing was seen until that point of time. If we try to situate a women in the nation, we just forget about how it is positioned within Indian uh, writing in English or Indian fiction in English. If we try to situate women and the aspects of gender in the context of the nation, we may have to begin really way back from the 19th century onwards with the colonial interventions. We know about the uh, the kind of impetus that uh, English education received after Macaulay's minutes in 1835 and uh, the English education, the uh, different modes of uh, uh, modernities, those were all seen as vehicles for social reform and modernization. And we have also seen how the nationalist reformers also were uh, also found this idea extremely conducive that English education can in multiple ways enhance the, the, the kind of modernity, the kind of uh, uh, initiation into modernity that India was uh, encountering then. And the status of the women, it was always a central concern for India's modernity. When we talk about uh, gender, when we talk about the issues related to women, it is difficult not to speak also about the various interventions initiated by the colonial, uh, by the nationalist uh, reformers and also the colonial administrators. We know about the extensive discourse in the context of uh, the, uh, the movements against Sati or the, uh, or the advocacy for uh, widow remarriage, about the need for female literacy, about the need to fight female infanticide. So the women question was always at the center, at the center of India's encounter with modernity. English education, most of the nationalist reformers and the colonial administrators believed would try and ensure a we try and take a mid path as far as a women's question is concerned. For that, in that sense, we find that 
the uh, uh, we find that women uh, were introduced to a number of morally enabling texts of English culture which they thought would be useful in order to retain certain traditional aspects which were part of the Indian culture and also initiate them into modernity, initiate them into English education uh, as uh, uh, far as the need of the hour was concerned. So, there was this desire within the nationalist men and as well as the modern educated men of those period to help and help women become companionate wives. They did not want the women to break out entirely of the traditional uh, strongholds. They did not want the women to challenge all kinds of traditional notions. They wanted patriarchy to exist in a certain form, but at the same time they wanted to enable the women to become companionate, companionate wives. And in a larger uh, sense of the extent this argument, the women were needed to support the framing, the support the formation of a modern nation. But it also had to be ensured that women will continue to be bearers of tradition, women will continue to ensure that tradition is not entirely destroyed with this uh, uh, new found uh, enabling, new found enabling modes of modernity. Partha Chatterjee very centrally addresses this question in his 1989 essay, The Nationalist Resolution of the Women's Question. In a couple of uh, sessions earlier also, we did refer to this essay. The English education and the new found access to various vehicles of modernity, this was found to be a double-edged sword as, as well. Kunkum Sangari and White, they have done some interesting work on this aspect at the intersection of tradition and modernity, especially with respect to women. They have noted, I read from their work, it is in this historical intersection that women began to constitute themselves in journals, autobiographies, poems, narratives and diaries and to which we owe the formation of an Anglo-Indian literature. Here Kungum Sankari and White are talking about an early phase from the late 19th century and uh, early 20th century onwards. This is also a phase when English education is being made available to all men and women, especially from a certain uh, uh, especially mostly from a certain uh, class. We also get to know that these women who are being educated to become companionate wives, to become, to be uh, being taught to maintain a certain kind of a uh, balance between tradition and modernity, they are also being encouraged to write. And this becomes a double edged sword. Modernization, the use of English language, not only enables them to become good individuals and good wives and educated citizens of the modern uh, nation, but it also encourages them to express themselves. This was perhaps something that the nation was not yet ready to deal with. That's a different question altogether that we shall not be going into in the, uh, going into the details of uh, right away. But what I'm trying to suggest here is that English education and modernity, which were predominantly colonial tools which were predominantly the tools of uh, uh, the nationalist uh, establishments, we find that those made available to, the, to women an unconventional set of tools and this, they used these tools to refashion themselves. In one of the earlier sessions when we had briefly taken a look at the one of the earliest uh, Malayalam novels, Indulekha, we did see how the central protagonist uh, Indulekha is being enabled to refashion herself in certain ways. And think about a woman who is not only now introduced to English education, but she also has a power to express herself. So, this is what education and modernity together began to do to uh, women's writing in the early 20th century. And this has been termed as a twofold adventure by Minakshi Mukherjee. She talks about how these women were also forced to reconcile between two sets of values. The one set of value was predominantly Western. This was obtained by reading an alien literature written in English, produced from England. And the other was their own experience. The experience that they that uh, was made available to them from their own immediate context, from their own uh, en engagements with family with society and with the context with the uh, different context of the nation. This did deal at least some of them to a lot of dilemma. They have wanted, they had to choose between uh, this alien culture which was enabling them and the immediate context, immediate life context which were closer to their heart but at the same time were 
delimiting and we are containing them in multiple ways. If you take one, one of the earliest examples, Atiyah Hussain's uh, partition novel, Sunlight on a Broken Column, it uh, speaks about the chasm between English education and an Indian lifestyle and there we find these articulations of the anxieties of belonging, of identity, of the need to associate oneself with a certain community. The act of writing historically, if we overview it, particularly when it comes to women, it has always been seen as a subversive activity. We do find the the kind of uh, mm, containment with which was at work whenever it came to uh, addressing the issues related to the act of writing by women. And um, women across uh, borders, across the uh, irrespective of the differences in terms of uh, uh, region, language, uh, community, class, caste, uh, everything, women across uh, a broad spectrum of all of these uh, 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 material things, they have realized that ultimate transgression can render them homeless and this is evident not just in certain kinds of cultures and certain kinds of languages we do find these uh, sort of uh, challenging articulations coming out from women writers even at the risk of uh, endangering themselves in various ways we find this in the english tradition if you take a look at it the writings of virginia wolf and how she even questions the absence of space when it comes to the ways in which uh, the uh, woman writer operates. So, now I am trying to draw your attention to the idea of home and how the act of writing which was being carried out from this home space as far as the early 20th century is concerned, this home space is the nation, the yet to be nation and the external influences are the colonial influences. When we move a little ahead in time during the post independence period, that is period when uh, this uh, novel that we are about to discuss today, Anita Desai's Cry the Peacock is uh, written. During that time, women are still being made to negotiate between these different spaces made available to them. They are still not too sure of how much they can express themselves, how much they are allowed to transgress, allowed to, I use it within quotes. They are still not sure how much of the modernity can be used to enable them and not too sure how much traditional they are expected to become in order to not endanger the kinds of facilities which are being av made available to them. Yeah. So, home in that sense, if we go back to uh, Partha Chatterjee's essay again, which is a useful entry point whenever we talk about the, na uh, uh, the issues of nation and how women are situated in that, he illustrates this idea to show about, to, sh to show us the role, the role played by the idea of uh, home within the nationalist space. The home in its essence must remain unaffected by the profane activities of the material world and woman is its representation. Partha Chatterjee is not talking about the literary writing, he is not talking about Indian writing in English, he is not talking about the writing of fiction by women, but this becomes very useful. This is useful for us to understand how even within Indian fiction in English, even within this space of literary writing, there is a way in which women are being invested with the responsibility of protecting home as the inner space and this space needs to be unsullied by contact with outside. It is inside outside dichotomy that we find being played out in most of the works written by women writers. This may operate at various levels when we look at a novel like Heat and Dust, we know that the, inner, uh, the outside inside dichotomy is played out in a totally different way altogether. He, there is a there we find a woman who is not entirely Indian, but who has got his, who's acquired a certain lived experience in India, who comes into contact with certain Indian men with whom she is negotiating certain relationships, relationships which are also sexual in nature. Yeah. But when it comes to a writer like uh, Anita Desai and her novel Cry the Peacock, we find a different kind of inside outside at work. We find citizens of the same country. We find men and women who belong to the same country, the same nation being forced to negotiate the amount of space that they can occupy within the home. And uh, in that context, it is also useful to remember that right from the beginning, men's adoption of western norms, men's uh, uncritical, adoption of, uh, un uh, uncritical adoption of modernity 
that was always seen as a practical necessity. There were no, no moral links to it. It was not seen as an act of loyalty or as an act of defiance. Nevertheless, we may also recall some of the anxieties that writers like Raja Rao had in writing in an alien language. But nevertheless, when they justify the need to write in English and when they produce their first work and a body of uh, writing in the alien language, in the foreign language, they are not being judged for that. On the contrary, their nas nationalist uh, loyalties, the practical necessity of this, all of those are strengthened, they are further strengthened. But as far as a woman is concerned, a woman's westernization has always been seen as a betrayal, which is why we have a number of writings from the 19th century onwards uh, giving moral codes to women, how to, how to behave, how to behave in this society so that your traditional values are not compromised beyond a certain extent. Yeah. So, this dichotomy is extremely interesting. Yeah, if I could draw your attention to the novel that we discussed in the previous class, A Strange Case of, case of Billy Bishwas by uh, Arun Joshi, we find that the man is allowed to do a number of things because he is disillusioned with modernity, because he finds it uh, 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 extremely important to identify and be in terms with his own self and the transgressions, the sexual uh, uh, transgressions, the, the moral choices that he makes, the betrayal if one could call it uh, uh, so, uh, that the family faces, those are not seen as moral or immoral choices. On the other hand, those are seen as the ways in which the man is allowed to respond to his self, the calling of his self, he is allowed to run away from home. But one needs to wait and see whether those kinds of uh, choices are being made available to the woman who is the protagonist in this novel Cry the Peacock. We find that she is forced to act, she is forced to behave only in response to certain confinements of home, certain expectations and her liberation cannot be at the expense of many other things which surround her. The stakes are placed quite differently as far as the uh, woman is concerned. Those are certain things that we shall come back to, uh, to uh, we shall try to come back to at a later point. I would like to press in this case to you that within the space of Indian fiction, the women's spaces are created from within a dominant patriarchal space and this is an argument which uh, some of the feminist critics have also put forward and they also argue that this has been framed by certain kind of persistence and these women only spaces this is uh, again in the context of uh, screening of the film uh, uh, fire which had caused a lot of controversy on account of his uh, uh, homosexual contents and uh, Gomati and uh, Fernandez who are uh, um, uh, social activists and uh, feminist uh, activists who were responding to the issues uh, related to the film fire they uh, stated that the women only spaces are allowed only if women in it are seen as sexually active within them. So, there is a provision for allowing women only spaces, there is a provision for enabling women spaces, but those spaces and the articulations which come out of those spaces should not necessarily challenge or subvert any of the existing notions. This seems to be the deal and unfortunately to a very large extent we find that the women's space which is generated from Indian fiction in English, from the space of Indian fiction in English that also operates within this dominant uh, patriarchal space. This is not to say that this, there is a formula for this kind of an operation, we do find uh, some of the novels say for example Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things challenging the gender rules in significant ways. There are women moving out of the patriarchal space and carving out a niche space for themselves though there is there is lot at stake that is a different question altogether again. Here also take this liberty to very quickly to a comparison between Chabwala whose work we saw a little earlier and Desai's work which we are just about to see. In the first essay that we discussed the introduction to uh, vintage book of Indian writing uh, uh, co-edited by Rushdi and uh, Elizabeth West. He argues that literature has a little or nothing to do with the writer's home address. Is this a case? We need to ask how the critical tradition configures and reconfigures notions of Indian as woman and home. If you take two writers, Chabwala and Desai, who are from totally different backgrounds, whose 
claims to Indianness are placed in two different ways, whose lived experiences are evaluated and are framed through various other social or uh, political mediations, you need to ask whether their home address play a role or no, whether their home address plays a role or not in the way their works are in the way their works are received. One also needs to ask whether this works differently when it comes to male writers and uh, uh, female writers. That is again another question that uh, we need to address. And um, what we can perhaps notice as a broad trend is that home as a gendered space affects men and women quite differently. This is very evident in the way we look at at least the, the last couple of novels that we had discussed, Strange Case of Billy Bishwas, Heat and Dust and today the novel when we see Cry the Peacock, it will be quite evident that home as a gendered space, I repeat it affects men and women differently. The articulations are different, the enabling, the modes of enabling are different, the ways in which the women characters are allowed to respond, the male characters are allowed to respond, those are radically different from uh, one another. And uh, mm, th there are of course a lot of concerns in addition to this we may need to gloss over at this point of time. But nevertheless these are certain useful questions to ask if you need to come up with newer frameworks to deal with uh, texts which do not neatly fit into the uh, available frameworks. It would be rather lame to say that all women's writing is always about resistance. It would be a very uh, lame claim to make and uh, it would be rather more nuanced, more useful and more nuanced if we say that women have been participants in the construction and transmission of these ideologies as they have also been shaped by them. So, it is not as if many of these articulations of subservience or of dominance, they are done through certain active set of ideologies with very uh, conscious uh, frame of mind, they could be inadvertent as well. But nevertheless, it needs to be admitted that women writers, women characters and women in general have also been participants in this uh, process of uh, constructing certain labels or constructing certain uh, identities because they too have been shaped by that. Whether we are looking at a work like Cry the Peacock or Heat and Dust or any of the other uh, novels written by women such as Kamala Markande, or Shashi Deshpande or at a later point uh, 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 even radically different work such as Arunthadi Roy's The God of Small Things, we begin to notice certain patterns and those patterns need not necessarily suggest a chronological development or progression. It is again not to say that we can trace the historical uh, evolution of women's movement or the historical uh, uh, the change in the articulation of the women's question if we look at uh, women uh, Indian women's uh, writing. Certain patterns may be evident, they may overlap each other, they may also be totally and radically different uh, from each other. I would uh, like to read to you from one of the concluding remarks made uh, in Chanda's book. A significant feature of Indo-English women's novels is the desire to project the past or at least some elements of it into the future. They propose alteration rather than a radical transformation of homes that they have known. The novels recommend reviewing and changing those aspects of traditional family life that silence women but acknowledge the overall importance of both family and tradition. We find some kind of a balancing act at work over here. We do not find the women writers entirely rejecting the ideas of home, rejecting the ideas of tradition, rejecting the ideas of patriarchy. We find them trying to renegotiate with all of these aspects, with all of these institutions and establishments. We try them trying to propose alterations. Here I also digress a bit and draw your attention to a novel that we will be doing at a later point, The God of Small Things by, uh, uh, by Arundhati Roy. Uh, one of the critics, Ajay Shekhar, has pointed out that Roy has been very successful in subverting the ideas of gender, subverting the, the uh, ideology of uh, patriarchy. But the same tool has not been used very successful when it comes to caste. There is a certain kind of containment, there is a certain kind of uh, 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 politics of containment which, is, which continues to be at work. That is something that we need to take a look at at a later point. But what I am trying to drive home is the idea that beyond a certain point it seems as if the women writers have not been able to entirely reject 
certain ideologies and certain conventions which had been historically, culturally and socially delimiting the articulations of women from the 19th century onwards. And also it needs to be admitted that whenever we talk about the space of Indian fiction in English, yeah, the house of Indian fiction in English, it is mostly a male preserve. You look at the successful, highly successful commercial uh, writers, even if you look at the award winning writers, you look at the set of writers who have been continually getting critical attention, you look at the uh, syllabi of Indian writing in English or Indian fiction in English, we find that it is entirely a male preserve. There is a certain space which would be perhaps even safe to say that within the house of fiction perhaps there is a room allotted to women who are writing, yeah? a room allotted to women within that room, within that space of containment, they are allowed to transgress, they are allowed to question, they are allowed to uh, radically alter the paradigms of many of the things which are being taught and thought, uh, being uh, taught to them and the, the thought which has been received by them. But beyond that point, it always needs to be reminded to them and it al always needs to be acknowledged by the critical tradition that their space is only a room inside this huge house of Indian uh, fiction in English, this huge house of fiction uh, within India. I would rather agree with uh, Gitanjali Singh Chanda's observation towards the end of her work that houses of fiction alter and, ex alter and extend the realistic models they invoke suggesting a strategy of change from within. Yeah. One would not really know how successful this strategy is going to be, but nevertheless it is very important to acknowledge that certain kinds of uh, paradigmatic, paradigmatic shifts are at work when it comes to women writing in English and also one needs to be attentive to the modes of altercations that these women writers are bringing forth even when that uh, that is not within the established frameworks of uh, uh, critical writings and critical understanding. I now also invite uh, one of our students uh, Ashwati to share with us some of the insights that she gained from her reading of the novel uh, Cry the Peacock. Um, it's me Ashwati Venugopal going to present on the novel uh, Cry the Peacock written by Anita Desai. Um, have any of you read any other novels of Anita Desai like very vague familiarity with the author? Yeah, so first of all, uh, we'll move on to the very short biography of the author, just in a very few details, just enough to understand the context of the novel the, in discussion. Yeah, so she was born in Masuri. I think today it's uh, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand area. And uh, she had a bicultural heritage because her father was a Bengali and her mom was from Germany. So she stayed in India till um, she had education. Uh, in the Delhi and only after marriage uh, that she went and settled in US. So she had this access to English, Bengali, German, so the access to so multiple languages and she spoke mostly, she spoke English, she grew up as a person who spoke English mostly at home like with parents and all. So it was basically English was home, she wasn't that alien to English or so she didn't like choose to write in English. She was educated, she spoke in English, so very much close to English in that way. She was shortlisted thrice for the Booker Prize and she had won Sahitya Academy Award in 1978 for her work. We'll look into a few of her works. And besides novels, she has written a few children's fiction, short stories. And these are very few of the popular novels. So Fire on the Mountain is the one that she won the Sahitya Academy Award for. Uh, in Custody is also very uh, critically discussed novel <coughs> and uh, Artist of Disappearance is a very, uh, the very recent one. Uh, fasting, Feasting, all of them, or all of them you can make out from the cover pages itself that they are mostly speaking about you know female protagonists, um, mostly engaging with women and uh, yeah. So now let us move on to the novel in detail. It was her first novel which was published in 1963 and um, she is one of the prominent among this line of Kamla Markandeya, Chabwala that we discussed in class um, of contemporary Indian English women's fiction. There is a whole genre like that. And she is also known as belonging to the second generation of Indian English novelists. So this is, is a very vague uh, classification I think we have already discussed in our one of our materials about Indian fiction divided into three phases and first generation belonging to Mulk Rajanand in the um, um, Arkin Narayan in uh, 
20s and 30s. And then there are a uh, few novelists, very prominent 50s and 60s, and then very modern ones that come post 1980s with Rushdie and Roy. So she is unique among all the women, Indian English women's fiction writers for a few reasons. I will move on to it. So before moving on to why, why this novel is significant or why this novel is, how can we place it in this long trajectory of Indian English women's fiction or generally Indian English fiction as such, is uh, that it, it assured in a new genre called psychological novel or psychological realism. So it's something very unique and, and Indian fiction was just uh, encountering it um, for the first time uh, among others among other women novels, or women based novels. So I will just quickly go through, since all of you might have read the summary, I will just very quickly go through the plot just enough to support my presentation. So basically there are Ma Maya and Ga uh, Gautama, two characters, husband and wife. But their temperaments are like on poles, like at both either side of the pole. Maya is a very sensitive, emotional, um, dreamy, um, so the, the probable uh, <laughs> adjectives that you can give to the character. And Gautama is, um, is this very practical, detached, intellectual guy. And this woman is, look, like, she, she, she takes happiness from very, very, <laughs> very, very small things in life. She, for example, she takes happiness from, say, um, flowers in her garden, from birds around her, from uh, animals that she is, in, from her pets. So that's how temperamentally different they are. So you can imagine this Gautama as this very, you know, so-called intellectual husband who sits and discusses over intellectual matters, world things, worldly things. Well, um, Maya has a very small but beautiful world. So the entire novel has three parts. First two parts is you have, you are actually living, dwelling inside Maya's mind. Like you, this, it's all first person narration and explaining, Maya is explaining her problems like starting with why she is uh, feeling alienated in her own house, why she is so temperament different from her husband Gautam, why she is not uh, uh, able to cop cope with uh, Gautama's you know character and all of, um, and then whole I think it's like three fourth of the novel I mean more than 90 percent of the novel is part one and part two explaining entire Maya, Maya the character you do actually dwell inside her brain and then part three just quickly switches off to uh, third person narration in which you, so this climax I think you know that she when, uh, I know it's again a spoiler, but she goes insane after all this neurotic development of hers and um, she is actually like, you know, by, by, like medically she is, you know, insane. And uh, that third part is the only one that you get a third person narration of their family life. So why this is called a psychological novel is because this is probably for the first time that Indian English fiction encountered look into inner consciousness of human being, inner self. It's entirely about Maya's mind, Maya's thoughts, Maya's whatever she thinks about. It's, it's, you can actually equate it to the stream of consciousness technique that whatever comes to her mind is entirely, it's a very direct or clear cut expression of what, it's, it's, it's actually in the form of dialogues itself, what she thinks. You come to know about the character of Gautama only through Maya's eyes for the first two parts, like only through Maya's eyes. And uh, how much you know about the character of Gautama is only through, it's very limited compared to what you know about the character of Maya. So that is why it's, you, you feel you, you, you are like an intimate witness to all of it or to, be, to put it better, you are actually dwelling inside her brain. Psychological realism, um, she said it was not a deliberate attempt of hers to do it. In fact, she was unique because she deliberately chose not to write about social themes, which other novelists of that time, I uh, think uh, Chabwala we discussed, she uh, discussed about social themes, East-West encounter, politics to some extent, uh, even other Indian English writers or women Indian English writers. Uh, she would deliberately put it, she has actually said it, my novels are no reflection of Indian society, you don't expect me to write about society, social themes, pressures and all of that, politics, character, nothing, nothing of, of those times or society of those times. They are part of my private effort to seize upon the raw material of life, its shapelessness, its meaninglessness. So she actually says, uh, 
what she actually expects from this literature according to her the purpose of literature is not to you know expre express her ideas or opinions about social themes or social economical political ideologies or something no it's it's it's, it's not the way that uh, she's going to shape it uh, she wants to look into actually thrive into you know human beings in a self of uh, human beings uh, she actually prefers the inner reality to the outer inside to sight that's what she says and private world is what she focuses on and uh, so in this case it's maya's private world it's her troubled sensibilities it's her troubled feminine sensibilities that is explained throughout the novel so hope you guys got a very vague idea of what the novel is talking about what is its significance in the trajectory what was anita desai trying to do through the novel now we'll move into the themes so themes so there is very very few critical material so because all in the previous presentations we have had like very popular critics minakshi mukherjee and other other very popular critics talking about novels but uh, even she herself hasn't talked much about this novel um so there are very few critical material if you go back and check um by popular critics as such so whatever you find are only a few things which are generally talking about aruna desai's female protagonist maya is projected as desai is exemplary of feminine consciousness how so she is one of the prominent interpretations say it's she is a representative of post modern feminism i'm sure you will feel it's a very heavy <laughs> loaded term but i'll just explain it in this particular context so as already explained in a post modern world you you focus on individual there is a um freedom power um sense of existence identity for an individual and women because they have been historically marginalized in the sense especially in indian societies where um there is some form of expectations about how she should be how a wife or a woman in the uh, house should be and uh, what she is gen she has been stereotypically limited limited to home domesticity so in this context it's important because in this novel women begin to see the universe with their own eyes not through male gaze like it's no way influenced by how the male world wants the women to look at the world and uh, societal norms that expect them to have so for example they should preserve family culture the entire burden of responsibility of preserving family should be on women so all, all these stereotypes associated with it is an entire the maya character is an entire uh, antithesis to all these stereotypes in fact postmodernism strives to get some acceptance from the audience about fracture it's actually fine to have you know fractured identity no identity is so linear so uniform that you always remain the same it's it's actually very very fine to have a fractured identity and that's exactly how uh, what uh, what deshai tries to portray through the novel she has an extremely fractured identity she is uh, partly maybe in the modern sense I, i don't know whether you can call it irrational or emotional i mean it's not the matter of uh, attaining uh, judging the character of maya it's all about she just doesn't give up to what other world which is dominated by so called patriarchy expects from her then there is a universal theme of alienation which is more prominent in the case of women subjects so anita deshai's novels almost all of them focus on solitary individual beings so here in this particular novel there is marital discord due to the uh, difference in their temperament and in fact there is a part where you have heard this uh, indian proverb called not proverb it's actually from the pida rakshadi kaumare putro rakshadi varthake exactly this is very, very it's a parallel to it so there is a dialogue for maya father brother husband who is my savior i am in need of one i'm dying and i'm in love with living i'm in love and i'm dying so many parallels from indian culture and marital discord is so explained in so clear cut detail that there is a dialogue from when she starts this is the initial part of the novel so she says giving me an opal ring to wear on my finger he did not notice the translucent skin beneath the blue flashing veins that run, ran under and out of the bridge of gold and jolted me into smiling with pleasure each time i saw it so this is a very clear cut entire you that that's literally how you dwell in somebody's mind you know exactly what maya is feeling about her relationship she's all sorts of expectations from her husband her relationship with her husband is all denied and um, to the point that there is very serious communication gap between the husband and wife and that turn she becomes rebellious in some sort but she can't express her rebelliousness even that's explained so she has a brother called arjuna 
he left home after fighting with their parents around the age of 22 or something she has this very great awe for you know feeling for a brother who actually made a you know had the courage to you know, like leave and show the how rebellious he is and um, it's all about this women caught in social economic cultural political crisis of all sorts and uh, to the point that ultimately she ends up losing her sanity losing her mental poise and uh, finally there is yeah bondage to tradition lots of already discussed what you expect from domestic lives of women and also ultimately there is discussion about when you actually dwell th uh, deep into it you can she is economically dependent on her husband uh, psychologically also she is really virile and like to the whole part of the novel she has never given up she is entirely uh, you know expecting so persistent in expecting what you know she feels from her what she expects from her husband the love the caring the need to be heard uh until to the point sh that she actually makes her that, that beautiful moment till that point that beautiful mo not beautiful exactly that that striking moment when she actually you know twists her uh, thought saying so till then it was either of them who was going to die after four years of her marriage uh in the fourth year she was just so disturbed with that thought she just just imagine that state of mind of hers when she just thinks oh It, it can't be me. me. I, I, I love life. Like, why should I die? Gautama is so detached. Like, it doesn't matter if she die, if he dies or not. <laughs> so, to the point. So, till that point, you know exactly what Maya is going through till the moment she reaches that particular thought. So, this is novel is a very good reflection of women's predicament as such because uh, after marriage you get uprooted from the family. You actually start belonging to the in-laws and very much uprooted from your own family. You don't have any identity attached to your family before you, uh, to the point you change your second name with your husband's name, and um, you belong to the in-laws. And uh, after that, there is some form of restriction on their freedom, their sense of freedom. um especially in this case because maya is childless so she faces some sort of loss of identity because when she goes with uh, when she goes to meet her peers uh, when uh, when she goes to meet the friends of her husband there is some sort of discrimination in that sort she is always seen with this i okay childless wife so this she is actually isolated in terms of that and beyond material comfort she is needs to be um heard all this needs nobody else in the novel realizes except we the audience the reader realizes it so much from what maya says and um for example there are other alternative interpretations of women of those times for example very interesting gautama's sister and mother is introduced in some parts so gautama's sister uh, her name is nila so she they, they present this positive symbols of you know strength and positivity unlike hers who always you know laments her a uh, predicament the novel says as ability to fight all the odds that come into her life and she actually says after 10 years with that rabbit i married i have learned to do everything myself and then there is leela and pom leela is her maya's friend uh, she is another alternate women character she is portrayed as a woman nursing her dying husband and she kind of accepts her fate like that's what indian women are supposed to do apparently at that time continues to live that way and there is maya's childhood friend pom she is a rebellious character but she tried to rebel against her mother in law's arrogance initially but ultimately she is succumbed to her dominance as what that's what the novel says so the alternate images of women you can very well compare them in contrast to maya's uh, character and then this beautiful theme of home you know especially in indian context so home you know you have this expression being at home because you know home is shelter some sense of protection some sense of private space in which you can freely express your identity without any restriction that's what you basically expect from a home you know so wherever you can express your identity your feelings freely that's where you feel at home this is an entire contradiction that this novel is an entire contradiction to how women conceive for indian women how home even the concept of home was you know dictated to them by the society their social identity was linked to home how they preserved their family how they was in their family uh, they as a secondary to the husband all, all of them especially during those times 1960s and 50s when anta desha is writing the novel it's very important even though within their family and society and all of that she is totally through social pressures all this pressures in the sense expectations burdens and uh, so their sense of she tries to that she finds it really hard to accept that confinement and uh, you know she is psychologically socially dislocated even inside a home where you actually are supposed to feel located um, very very comfortably and uh, in a sense of individuality everything is so threatened inside the home 
because in laws her husband nobody tries to understand her again it's not part of judging her you know you just accept her as she is and um, i just talked about the stereotypes in indian legends and cultures just the putra rakshadi that part uh, where there's lot of similar stereotypes too and there are i think metaphors like especially with the title oh that this is really important so the title cry the peacock we were wondering why is what is the significance of the title with the story so she mentions in some part the peacocks are a very interesting story the peacocks apparently in their mating process they actually fight with each other to the point either of them actually gets injured gets defeated to the point that they actually die so this is what the concept of dying in love so that's exactly if we put it on to maya's life you know she is fighting for love till the end and ultimately to the point she kills her husband the title itself is a metaphor do we smile it off as such today when you when you actually look through the novel at some moments you actually might feel justified at certain points so not justified in the sense you tend to understand what maya is going through she is psychic in some sense you we need to accept that she reacts too much she actually lives every moment but every moment she lives through her senses that's it that that's what makes her different so this is almost about the main themes or portrayal of indian women in the novel moving on to how she anita desh has brought about some indian ness because uh, in in the novel is through no other description of the context of the place where they are living other than some pl- place they say they went so she is going for shopping with her in-laws which is in delhi that's only mention of the place otherwise the novel is so, such a compelling narrative you don't even feel the need to like know the background place temporal setting or the spatial setting it's the only place where you mention that it's in india where it's happening and there is um, weather flora fauna religious and mythical figures like there's a mention of shiva and the tandava dance of death and um, really folk elements the novel is entirely surrounded at this astrologer's prophecy you know the uh, prediction all of them is very much centered in indian culture prediction you know the, the, that's a whole description of the astrologer she he is a albino and you know it's actually you go through some psycho thriller movie that's how you feel when you read the novel and there's like lot of images coming through and the like very very disjointed images and then then random progression of images exactly how you feel when you read the novel and then just to show that india she is a you know supposedly indian woman there like she she sometimes says so she went with her f- husband to some party in which um, talks about cabaret goers like people who go and attend cabaret dances and all that and she's like no like she's not really influenced by it but she uh, actually condemns it like you know is what supposedly the stereotyping of indian women as such and um, her use of indian english is very important in the novel to um, especially in our course indian fiction in english we need to understand that it was a literary language because she she acquired it through her schooling like she first of all in at a at a age of 7 or 9 she started writing her first story as a first novel she started off because she was educated in that language it's nothing different about it missionary school education delhi college education it is she actually says it's her literary language that she, she is using and uh, and her english is you can't say it's uniquely indian it's uniquely her own english you know there are a lot of metaphors like uh, just shiva and the myth from all these folk tales all of those examples and it's very much grounded in indian culture indian myths and tales and um, ultimately she all these novels most of her initial novels are entirely psychological novels like um, going into mostly women protagonists individuals you know female self alienation all these universal themes but much later like towards her later part of her literary career she is uh, writing more of you know social reality she has actually the artist disappearance of novel that i should just show very he so now she actually realized she should be you know in um, venturing some uh, some time into not just not just limited to individual things and uh, she has some relevant topics to discuss or to write in her novels about social themes and towards her later part she the, her actual so this is a entire journey of her life you know just how the themes focus how the writer's interest changes over time due to context or due to the response to her novels and all of that so really sorry i couldn't bring out any you know very critical perspectives because it actually lack any even um just before the uh, class in the discussion where we, i had with ma'am she was saying she never encountered some she herself was not talking much about the novel in her uh, you know this particular novel and she talks about many of her other novels but not this novel so i'm just still pondering over why what uh, could have been the reasons why this would not have happened i'm still pondering over it 
my presentation would be li might be limited in that sense because unlike compared to other novels couldn't get like a critical material on it but these are the major themes which are very grounded very much grounded in india and in context indian women and uh, this inauguration of this genre called psychological realism is what made anita desai you know uh, immortal in the trajectory that's pretty much of it uh, i hope you got a general not general idea like a very good idea i hope you are inspired to go back and read the novel <laughs> that's a basic expectation yeah that's it a couple of other things that i would uh, like to draw your attention to uh, in terms of this novel cry the peacock uh, firstly we need to notice the mode of publication of this work cry the peacock the novel it was initially published by uh, orient paperbacks and this was the publisher with the uh, home most of the indian writers was engaging with in their earlier period but we do find that in the post 1980s they all move towards uh, global publishers there's more visibility to their work it also ensures you know better kind of saleability and marketability as well but we find anita desai sticking to orient paperbacks for a long time especially in the early stages of her career and cry the peacock is uh, uh, one of her earliest novels and uh, 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 certain things which would be useful from the uh, uh, certain details which we need to pay attention from the novel i would like to uh, bring it bring to your attention uh, some di certain discussions related to this novel do remind us of uh, the uh, the, uh, uh, the the play uh, dolls house by ibsen we find the character of maya undergoing a radical change from the beginning towards the end of the novel and this uh, there's a certain parallel that we can see in the ch uh, change that uh, the character in doll's house nora undergoes from the beginning towards the end even in this novel in the beginning we see that it's not as if maya is married to a bad man he's not a bad uh, sort of fellow at all in fact in page 38 of this novel in the beginning uh, we find maya making this observation people say he spoils me This means that he fondles my cheek, holds my hand and says to me, "It's getting warm. Time for us to retreat to the hills, isn't it? Where shall we go this year, Maya? Choose." People say he spoils me. They also say that I can get anything I want from him. Darjeeling, I cry jubilantly, of course, and jump up and down at his side. So we find uh, Maya being treated as a child by her husband and she also marvels at this she's uh, she's delightful about this kind of attention that he is uh, she's getting from her husband in the beginning of the novel in the earliest stages of her life we also find that there are traces of discontentment within maya's uh, life within her personality but at the same time in the first half of the novel we are not really being introduced to it there are snippets of this that uh, anita desai uh, gives us from her uh, character there is this particular instance this uh, comes in page 63 when maya encounters this woman who has uh, four daughters we find her having these horrible thoughts about having four daughters maya thinks this ought not to have distressed me she's talking about the possibility of having four daughters I ought to have been able to rejoice at this as my father had rejoiced in me saying that in a daughter he had a treasure yet now the word brought up visions of dowries of debts humiliations to be suffered and burden so gross so painful that the whole family suffered from them why i was angry with myself yet could not shake off the truth and when the prim lady clucked her tongue in sympathy i said nothing yeah so this is a very telling um, passage it seemed as if dowry sati the issues of the widow all these were concerns all these were concerns which had long been buried during the nationalist phase that post independence period we had begun a new journey to modernity but here we find a novel written in the 1960s and the nation is still young and this young educated woman is still horrified at the possibility that raising four daughters also means dealing with a lot of issues related to dowry humiliation this certainly is not the kind of see she is certainly not thinking about the possibilities that the female gender offers but she is thinking about the many many uh, ma many many difficulties that would be inflicted on to the family and also about uh, the change that comes about in maya's character towards the end just like we find the character of uh, nora undergoing a radical change in the doll's house towards the Uh, end of the play we find maya also beginning to uh, 
think and speak in a different way altogether. This comes at page 139, almost towards the end of the novel. What is death then? I asked, dropping down one earring after the other, two red rubies. What is death to you, Gautama? Do you believe it? And uh, her husband replies, perhaps if you clarified what you mean by death, I could tell you whether you believe in it or not. Though why should you give thought to such a subject mystifies me. It is definitely a new trend in you. You used to tell me that you were far too immersed in your garden and your cat and your friends to muse upon death. Yeah? And this is also an uh, allusion to some of the earlier conversations that you, they used to have. Maya was a young woman who was interested in gardening, interested in pets and those were the things that used to interest her, worry her. Those were her concerns. Her world was very, very limited within her own uh, home space and her garden and her and the beings which surrounded her. So, a husband is certainly, Gautama, her husband is certainly alarmed when she suddenly talks about a very profound subject such as death. And he says, is this what you keep thinking about of these days? You are much too young. And they continue to have, have this conversation. There was a time when you would have disdained so banal a consolation. That was a time when I did not need you to console you with banalities. One changes, grows. Yeah. So, Maya herself is beginning to realize that she has grown and that she has changed. And obviously, this is not something that Gautama is willing to deal with. He is not yet ready to uh, accept the grown-up version of Maya because it was so easy to manage a childlike wife who would just listen to whatever he says and who would also delight at the prospect of a holiday, the prospect of uh, 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 pets, cats, gardening. It was that kind of a relationship perhaps was uh, far easier for him to manage. And as a, a novel progresses and uh, when we reach almost uh, again towards the end, we find Maya growing up enough to pity her husband. Yeah, we find that she is no longer the self who is timid, who is a cowardly. She grows up enough to pity the character that her husband has turned into. She says, poor Gautama, poor dear Gautama who was so intense and yet had never lived and never would. Yeah. Here we find that Maya is in control of herself, her household and as well as her husband and Gautama is obviously terrified and uh, we know the kind of uh, end that he is, uh, uh, he met with. I would not give away the novel and spoil the interest uh, of uh, reading that by yourself. Uh, but nevertheless, it needs to be remembered that if you look at the way in which Maya's character has transformed, if you look at the many minute details that even uh, in the presentation Ashwati shared uh, with you, you would see that Maya is able to enable herself, but this enabling of herself, her progressive faith in her own self is at the cost of losing herself in a certain way. As in when she gains herself, as in when she is, comes to terms with her own self, when she takes uh, charge of her own life, we also see that she is beginning to be seen as someone who is descending into madness and uh, she totally loses control over her mind towards the end. So, what is at stake over here? Why is it that always a woman who is being enabled, she also is forced to meet with certain kinds of uh, ends which are not entirely enabling, which are not entirely fulfilling. We do find again if you try and co try to compare and contrast this with uh, the fate of Billy Bishwas. Yeah, there would be certain kind of parallels, but also we would see that whether it is a primitive kind of society or a modernized urban society, the choices which are being made available to men and women are radically different. And while I, uh, uh, um, unless the, the the world of fiction is also able to break out of these limiting ways of conceiving uh, in, 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 in individualism, limiting ways of conceiving freedom, there is very little possibility of uh, uh, radically changing the idea of women's writing or radically changing the ways in which women can be accommodated into this house of fiction, the, the certain suggestions that we so, what here is uh, extremely important is the idea of home and how that becomes problematized in the field of fiction and how the problematization of home is seen as essentially a kind of thing which happens only and mostly in the fiction written by women.
So with this we wind up for today and we will meet again uh, in the next class.